something happening here. How many of you have ever seen a TED Talk that changed your life? Can I see a show of hands? A TED Talk that changed your life. How many of you have seen it? Okay, almost a quarter. That's really good. It happened to me too. It was New Year's Day 2013. Outside, it was six degrees. Gray clouds were blocking out the light of the sun, and rain was dribbling down on my windows. A typical Dutch winter's day. I had some free time between my late breakfast and a visiting friend, and I remembered I had this TED Talk by Polly Higgins on my to-do list. So I turned on my computer, and I, watched, I, um, I sat down to watch it. And 18 minutes later, something had fundamentally changed inside of me. All of a sudden, I understood why I had become a lawyer, why I had left the world of law behind in my mid-twenties disillusioned, and most importantly, why it was now time for me to return to it. Two and a half years later, I'm standing here on this red dot of TEDx Harlem, giving a talk about enlightenment. So let me explain you something about the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a very important period in the development of law. It gave us the separation of state powers and fundamental rights and freedoms. Central was the idea of liberation. The Enlightenment liberated individuals from repressive traditions, from power abuse by almighty kings, Thanks to fundamental freedoms such as the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion and the freedom of property, individuals could now act, think and believe as they wanted, as long as they did not violate the rights of others to do the same. Another characteristic of the Enlightenment was that it further developed the philosophy of materialism, which says that matter is all there is. Thanks to scientific breakthroughs, we could now measure, understand, and control the natural world, or so we thought. Also, we organized the natural world into neat categories or segments, because the third element of Enlightenment thinking is thinking in terms of separation. The Enlightenment separated facts from values, reason from faith, and humans from nature. Nature lost its sacred dimension in the Western world. Nature became an object that we could use and exploit. The invention of the steam engine played a very important part in this. Because thanks to the steam engine, ships could now cross the world seas independent of the strength in the direction of the wind. Colonists and merchants could now access foreign countries and the raw materials they held at their own control. So the idea emerged that we could conquer foreign peoples, but we could also conquer the earth herself. Legislative bodies paved the way for this because they, because they passed laws that uh, enabled companies like the Dutch East Indies Company to go and conquer the world. I think that these words by the British philosopher William Durham really captured the spirit of that time. He said, we can ransack the globe, penetrate the bowels of the earth, descend to the bottom of the deep, travel the farthest regions to acquire wealth. In the 20th and 21st century, we've really seen the effects of this way of thinking, this exploitative way of thinking, in combination with the very powerful technologies we have right now. Because natural disasters, as a result of climate change, are the talk of the day. And so are ecocides. Ecocides are the massive damage and destruction of ecosystems. 
For example, the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the overfishing of the North Sea, and the destruction of the Amazon. We've come face to face with the effects of a system. Back. <laughs> Back. We've come face to face with the effects of a system that places profit above people and planet. Unfortunately, law has not been able to turn this around. Environmental law has done great things in protecting parts of nature, but it has not been able to address the core flaw in our legal system, and that is that the Earth is considered to be an object instead of the living, super-complex organism that it really is. So when the Enlightenment liberated individuals, it contributed to a way of thinking that has enslaved the natural world. And law helped this process. And this disillusioned me so much 10 years ago that I decided to leave the world of law behind. But on that New Year's Day 2013, something shifted in me. Because all of a sudden, I realized that there were now lawyers around the world who were waking up to the fact that if we enslave the natural world, we also threaten our own freedom. Because without a clean and safe living environment, it's really hard to enjoy my right to health, or my right to education or to employment. Simply put, there are no human rights on a dead planet. And this realization lies at the basis of the climate case that Urgenda, the Dutch organization Urgenda, started against the Dutch state. I joined that case together with almost 900 other Dutch citizens, people like you and me. On April 14th of this year, we went to the court in The Hague, and we presented our arguments and demands. We said that the state is not honoring its duty of care towards us citizens by not reducing CO2 emissions quickly enough to avoid climate catastrophes. And we stood there, present generation, asserting our right to a clean and healthy environment. But we also were there to represent future generations, because the children of, their, of our children, they don't have a voice. They have no way to influence the decisions that are taken today. They are powerless, but they will so greatly be affected by whatever is decided today. So we stood there giving them a voice, and I found this display of solidarity between generations a very beautiful thing. Other lawyers made a more radical move. They left the focus on human rights behind, and they placed the Earth central. We call them Earth lawyers. They say, the Earth is not an object, it's not property, we're not its owners. The Earth is a living being, it's alive. It has rights, it has intrinsic value, regardless of its value for us, humans. We have to balance and harmonize our own laws with the laws of nature. When I heard that, I was very excited. It made sense to me on a gut level. But I also realized there was a challenge, because how are we going to bridge the systems? How are we going to get from where we are right now, where the Earth is an object, to a world where the Earth has rights, the rights that we respect? So I set out on a journey to discover the answers to those questions. I interviewed Earth lawyers, I published about these developments. I joined national and international campaigns. And much quicker than I could have phantomed two and a half years ago, these heroes of mine, they became my colleagues. And I was asked myself to speak about Earth law, and I was being interviewed. I also realized that the break I took from law served me to prepare me to come back to it. Because now I could use my skills in communication 
and my experience with event organizing that I had gained in the meantime to help spread the message of Earth Law. I also encountered a group of like-minded people in Amsterdam, people who had started an organization, an online documentary platform to spread these ideas. I joined their organization, and we are called Facing Crossroads. Central to the work of Facing Crossroads, and the topic of that TED Talk that changed my life, is the mission of Scottish lawyer Polly Higgins. Polly Higgins, uh, for the last five years, is on a mission to make ecocide the fifth crime against peace. Let me take you back to the origins of the word ecocide for a moment. Who of you knows about the gas Agent Orange? Can I see a show of hands? Almost all, that's wonderful. Well, Agent Orange was obviously not very wonderful because the American army used this gas in the Vietnam War to destroy the crops of the jungle so that they could see the enemy. And they managed to do that on a massive scale. But they also poisoned the health of more than one million Vietnamese children, women and men, who were greatly affected. Many of them died, many of them were deformed. It was a tragedy. And Arthur Galston, he was an American biologist, who had spent the 1950s in his laboratory making a chemical substance for the U.S. Army. That chemical substance became part of Agent Orange. When Arthur Galston saw the images of deformed children, he felt so appalled. He thought, what have I done? I have contributed to this disaster, to creating a monster. He became an anti-war activist overnight. He was the first in 1970 to call the massive damage and destruction of ecosystems an ecocide. And ecocide was, uh, became part of the public debate. It even became part of the Statute of Rome, which is the founding treaty of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. But it didn't make it to the finish line. Ecocide was taken out of the treaty text. And right now, Polly Higgins is on a mission to correct that error. She wants us to speak up collectively to say it is illegal to make money out of destroying the natural environment. This should be a crime against peace. I fully agree with that. And I know that if enough enough speak up and support her mission, we can make this a reality. Another Earth lawyer who I greatly admire and who I had the honor to interview is South African Cormac Cullinan. Cormac was a law student who joined the anti-apartheid um, resistance in South Africa. And when the apartheid regime fell, he became a lawyer and a maker of environmental laws. And he realized that now that the apartheid regime had fallen, the new challenge was the enslavement of the natural world because he saw the limitation of the legal system that sees nature as an object. He realized he could never do justice to the natural world in that system. He wrote a book called Wild Law, and in Wild Law, he proposes a new system, a system in which we humans balance our rights with the rights of nature, a system in which we agree that nature is worthy to be protected, I realize that might, sound, that might sound quite utopian, but the interesting thing is that principles of wild law found their way to the Constitution of Ecuador really soon. In 2008, Ecuador changed its constitution, and it gave rights to Mother Earth in its Chapter 7. Bolivia has done the same in its national laws. In the United States of America, more than 30 communities have given rights to nature. In Belize, a court ruled that the reef is not an object, but a living being that should not be exploited for commercial gains. Just four days ago, a high court in Delhi, India, ruled that birds have the right to fly. <laughs> they should not be kept prisoners in cages 
and they should not be subjected to cruel treatment. Right now, a group of European citizens is preparing a petition for the European Commission asking that we give rights to nature in Europe. When they get one million signatures, the European Commission has to listen to them. So these are very positive developments, and I could give you so many more examples. But then my TED talk would take way too long, so I'm not going to do that. But what I feel is that these examples, these developments, are proof that something is changing. Something in our mindset about how we relate to nature is changing. I'm so excited to be part of that. The question is, is this changing quickly enough? Unfortunately, for many people around the world, the answer is no. Because small-scale farmers and fishers and hunters, especially in the developing world, and especially from indigenous peoples, every day are confronted with the land grabs of their farmlands, with the pollution of the rivers they fish in, with the destruction of the forests they live in, by hands of companies who want to grab the resources like wood and oil and coal and fish to make money. And many of them don't accept it. They stand up to, and to defend their environment. And that's why we call them environmental defenders. But the tragic thing is that being an environmental defender is such a dangerous thing to do. Because according to Global Witness, on an average, every week, two environmental defenders are murdered just because they speak up for the environment. One of them was this man, Indra Palani from Indonesia. He was killed last February in a struggle between farmers and a local paper corporation. He was murdered by security forces. He was just 22 years old his whole life ahead of him. NGOs worldwide are now placing a spotlight on the work of environmental defenders such as Indra Palani. I believe that being in the public eye can make all the difference for their private safety. Also, the organization Grout has done something fantastic. They have created an online platform for crowdfunding for the work of environmental defenders. So we can financially support them in their David versus Goliath-like struggles. So what environmental defenders and earth lawyers are doing is they are using their fundamental rights and freedoms, their freedom of speech, their freedom to demonstrate to help restore the Earth. They realize that we can only be free if the Earth is healthy, if the Earth is safe, if the Earth is clean. And the sharp distinction between humans and nature is dropping away. Because this time, we realize that we're always connected to nature, because we're part of nature. So in the Enlightenment 2.0, we use our individual uh, fundamental rights and freedoms, not in isolation. We use it in the context of a flourishing Earth community. We use them in relationship with the Earth. I personally have found my purpose, thanks to that TED Talk. I realized I want to use my freedom of speech and my legal background to express my love for the Earth and my love for those who defend her. I took the inspiration I got from that TED Talk and with it literally changed the course of my life. I've come to realize that when an idea captures you so strongly as it did to me, it probably means that you're meant to become one of its spokespersons. For me, this has been a journey of daring to stand up and take my space and speak up for something I believe in. And I believe that all of us speak, should speak up for the Earth. I think that all of us, we should all use the fundamental rights and freedoms we got in the first enlightenment to contribute to the second one. We should be the voice for the earth. We should demand that we leave this crazy system behind that makes money out of destroying the earth we live on, the earth that nurtures us. 
So I want to do a call out to you. Please, step up. Be that voice for the earth. Do what you can in your own private life. Make a difference. She needs you. And there are so many ways to do so. You can support the environmental defenders on ground. You can sign a petition to make ecocide a crime, a petition that I know makes a real difference. And you can join us at Facing Crossroads. I am committed to doing this. And whenever I have a day that I feel discouraged, a day that I feel it's too much of an uphill battle against these big corporations, I remind myself of these words by poet Denise Levertov that always give me great hope, and I will end with that. We've only begun to love the earth. We've only begun to imagine the fullness of life. How can we tire of hope? So much is in bud. Thank you very much.